we will start commercial operation this year, not in 10 years, this year. You've got a record as saying if you can do this in Paris this summer, you know, you can do it every, anywhere. Flying in a city from A to B and backwards is a total different profile than flying international on an Airbus A220. Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the future of urban air mobility, which uh, I'm absolutely fascinated about. Um, we're going to meet Dirk Hoke, uh, starting at Renault. Um, his career spans over 25 years and five continents. Um, he worked for Siemens for 20 years. He was the CEO of Airbus Defense and Space. And now he's leading Volocopter to make the most innovative revolution in urban mobility of the century so far, which is bringing electric air taxis to market. This sounds extremely challenging. It might sound like science fiction, but you may see these flying taxis sooner than expected. Um, they're due to take off in Paris uh, this summer, a very big summer busy summer with the Olympic Games going on. Um, to speak about this and to talk about your wildest prediction, here we are today with Dirk Hoke. Welcome to the show, Dirk. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I think this is going to be great. Let, let's go crazy to start with. Let, let's start with your wildest prediction for the future. I think there are two. First of all, I believe that mobility ownership uh, will come to its end uh, in the next decades. The second one is, I believe that the skies will be the epitome of mobility as a service, electrification and digitalization. So we will see a massive change because of there is a tremendous need for mobility and access to transportation, but definitely not enough resources on this planet to, to cope with individual ownership of cars on the street or electric vehicles in the, in the air. So is this everyone always? You're saying we're not going to own cars or is this just for some UK use cases um, here and there? I think you had a, a podcast about going to uh, driverless cars. And uh, I think um, in that it already was elaborated that there will be a coexistence, especially in certain countries for a long time. But what is very simple is that uh, we today don't have enough resources. If we see that there's continuous need for uh, access to mobility um, and if just only every inhabitant on this planet would have a car we couldn't we couldn't cope with that demand so so there will be a need to share um, the access to mobility and uh, that's why i believe there will be a massive change on the streets and definitely we have to make sure that we don't repeat what we did on the streets in the air in, in a good way, this seems incredibly ambitious. Um, there must be a lot of people that think you're a bit crazy for undertaking something like this and for having such a kind of bold ambition for the future. Yeah, I think that's normal. Whenever we introduce new mobility concepts or new technologies, I think a lot of people believe it's not feasible or it will take decades. Uh, we will start commercial operation this year, not in 10 years this year. Will it be already everywhere? No, it will be only accessible to a few. It, the demand will be higher than the supply, but it's the first step. It's like when we introduced the first commercial aircraft and Tony Janus in 1914 flew the first passenger only a few kilometers from St. Petersburg to Tampa. And uh, when, when Elon Musk introduced his uh, first Tesla Roadster and the people were like, yeah, that's a nice toy, but where can you charge it? It is something that starts slow, but then suddenly 10 years later, people adopted to it without even knowing it. And I think that's the same status now for us. We open up a new industry, we open up a new modality, and it looks like a toy at the beginning because we only transport one pilot, one passenger. And then a few years later, we transport one pilot and four and then five. Um, and then it continues to grow on the payload side and the passenger side. And suddenly people say, okay, that's, that's normal. And, and uh, I integrate it into my daily commuter um, instead of using a bus or a, a taxi. I will use for a piece of my, my daily commuter, I use also a Volo City flight. Yeah. So Dirk, um, how does this all work today? What kind of vehicles are you flying? How do they go anywhere? How long do they last for? Tell us how the kind of experience feels today. Yeah, we, we built not only one product, we built a family of products. Um, the first one that we will fly next year, or this year, sorry, we're already 24, we fly this year in Paris, 
is the Volo City. It's a multi-copter design specialized and focused to fly in a city environment. Very quiet, very safe, and uh, of course sustainable. All our, our all our vehicles are fully electric. The second vehicle that uh, will be released somewhere 27, 28 is a five-seater um, optimized for regional connections flying up to 200 kilometers uh, in one hour. Um, and then the third one is a cargo drone, which can transport uh, around uh, 150 kilos, um, and uh, which is also used as a technology demonstrator. So where we test automated functions going towards autonomy and when certification is prepared, uh, for being used also on passenger vehicles, then we can use this kind of experience to put it also on the water city and the water region. So these three vehicles, and they're all uh, working on one platform. So we have um, also developed a software platform called Volo IQ, which we use, first of all, for all the flight test and monitoring, but also then for the execution of the commercial operation, where we do the flight planning, including weather, weather forecasting, um, and then, of course, also the ticketing and the booking system in order to prepare for the flights. So this is the the, the ecosystem that we have developed, and uh, which will start with the city flying this year in summer in Paris. I'm trying to sort of figure out where this belongs. Like in, in some ways, it's kind of um, where autonomy and sort of autonomous vehicles meet drones, which meet sort of battery power and EVs. And then that's also sort of meeting with sort of Uber and the idea that you kind of call these things on demand rather than owning them. You know, what does this sort of future look like? How does this sort of fit into our lives? You know, at what point do people decide to take this rather than Uber or owning a, you know, a, an ultra light jet or something like that? Yeah, I think there, there are a couple of um, parameters that will drive the scaling. First of all, the battery technology, how fast they develop and how fast we can uh, use bigger vehicles with more capacity, more passenger seats. The second topic will be uh, the integration into air traffic management, because today the capacity is very limited. It's all controlled by humans, but we face massive challenges with the growth on the commercial aircraft side already. So this will be a massive step when we go into digital transformation and being able to integrate not only more commercial aircraft, but also passenger and cargo drones uh, on top into the air traffic management. And the third one, is driven by our growing population on this earth um, uh, because we are going from eight towards 10 billion people. We Today, we have 56% of the world population living in cities already, 4.4 billion people. And uh, we expect that by 2050, we are probably 70% of the population uh, living in cities. And it's very simple. We cannot continue to allow individual transportation because the streets are not big enough, the amount of resources are not big enough to cope with that demand. So there will be a high push towards mobility as a service and uh, not only on the streets, but definitely also in the air. And uh, we cannot repeat what we did on the streets. So we have to offer it as mobility as a service, uh, making it accessible to everyone, especially in areas where you cannot build another metro system or having not enough space for a bus rapid transit system or any kind of other mass transit system. So we will have the need to have an additional modality on top. And we believe that the future is electric and that uh, we can add that flexibility into the city planning of tomorrow. Um, how does it work if, if too many people want to use this? I mean, I was at a, a, a sort of show last night with Jerry Seinfeld, and he sort of vanished quickly by helicopter very close to me, and I, I was quite envious. But then I thought if, if everyone here with the Rolls Royce was actually taking a helicopter, then the skies would probably be so crowded that it would be um, as, as sort of painful getting a helicopter as it would be driving from the, the parking structure. So no. is there a kind of move towards software being such that these vehicles are all talking to each other and coordinating that? Way? Yes. In order to get to higher density traffic, as you described, it anyhow is not possible with the means that we have today. So we need to go um, not only to the integration into the air traffic management, but we definitely have to develop new systems, which will be more like a mesh network in the sky where, where all these vehicles talk to each other, know exactly where they're positioned to each other, also to allow higher, higher frequency flying and also allowing to fly closer to obstacles. 
all of that is needed. But even then, we, we will be far away from any kind of scenario where it looks like in the fifth element or the dis your fear that you just described. I think um, it will be a restricted. It will be only uh, complementary to existing mass transportation. It will not replace mass transportation. It will give individual other uh, options in case of um, that they bottlenecks. And it will definitely also have a huge use case in areas where today we use uh, helicopters in cities which are much louder and not as safe. Um, for example, for transportation of emergency medical service, bringing the doctor to an accident in a shorter time, or transporting organs to, um, to surgery uh, in a shorter time, uh, more sustainable and more quiet. So these kind of um, use cases will be on top of the transportation use case. Do you kind of, uh, this is probably quite a, a mean question, but do you have a kind of sense of when in the future the cost of delivering services like this mm -hmm. will put it within the reach of quite a lot of people for fairly special circumstances? You know, I'm guessing sort of three times the cost of an Uber, something like that. I believe that still in this decade, we will be able to compete with um, a taxi on the street. Uh, where you have, let's say, around two to three euro per kilometer as a price. Uh, of course, also these prices are calculated dynamically depending on the time that you order a taxi. But uh, we will have a similar case and we will be competitive towards street taxis and Ubers or in, in, a, in a mega city. Quite often when you talk about the future, it actually seems that a better question is not when will this happen, but where will this happen? Um, you've gone on record as saying if you can do this in Paris this summer, you know, you can do it every, anywhere, um, which says quite a lot about your ambition deliberately sort of taking on the, the challenging places. Um, as you look around the world, are there particular uh, sort of markets where there's a more um, open minded and ambitious uh, sense towards welcoming this form of transport, or is it is it quite hard everywhere in the world? I, I think the first approach is to look at cities that are today already um, open to helicopter transportation in the cities or in the city environment, and these uh, there are still a lot of cities that use helicopters. Um, so these cities are an easy win, of course, because uh, if we can replace them transporting people to the airport, for example. Uh, and whoever has arrived uh, on a morning aircraft in Sao Paulo in the morning in a rainy day uh, trying to get to downtown for a meeting on time, um, I think uh, who understands that, that there is a huge business case to, for, for business passengers and for people that have is to arrive at a certain point of time at a certain location. Um, but this is one use case and there are many other cities what we also see that in the discussion with uh, city and regional developers there's a high interest to look at a larger perspective of a holistic view on this topic because if you have a region that is underdeveloped and it's uh, most of the use cases show that it's not valid to um, put a train system or uh, even a bus system in place because it's an underdeveloped residential and commercial area. But uh, we see that a lot of real estate developers are interested if we could plan for a vertiport in that area, they would be willing to invest into the development of residential and commercial areas because with that, they would have a guarantee that it would be part of a larger ecosystem. So these kind of things can be used to have a different uh, approach towards city and urban uh, and also regional development, uh, just planning 15, 20 years in ahead how you can build a network of vertiports to connect, uh, let's say, underdeveloped areas to the mega points, to the hubs um, in, in the close environment. I'm always aware, um, you know, there's that wonderful kind of quote um, from Marshall McLuhan first we sort of change our tools and they sorry first we shape our tools and they shape us and there are times when new technology seems to do 
quite an interesting thing with the current paradigm, but it's actually about the world that we can create around that technology where things get interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine a scenario where people can live on islands and they can to you know they can travel to and fro from work quite easily. You can imagine more distributed cities. You can imagine people living in more sort of um, rural areas. At what point does the distance become quite problematic for these types of vehicles um, in the medium term future? Um, yeah, we start, as I said, flying Paris uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 kilometers at the beginning, only one pilot, one passenger. Not because we decided so, but this is what we can do with the existing battery technologies. And we see with the roadmap from different suppliers and also seeing what automotive is currently doing, that in the next years, we will get to 350 to 400 watt hours per kilo, and then also towards 500 watt hours per kilo. And this, this enables, of course, larger distances, higher payloads and different use cases. So we will see a massive change over the, the next years towards the end of the decade based on the, the new technologies that we can see on the battery sector. So also, of course, we see development like the IRA, where we see massive investments in North America and new battery factories. So we can expect um, a big jump on the technology side in the, in the next five years. Well, it's, um, what, what are the biggest things holding you back? Like, it, like, is it mainly sort of battery and in particular sort of energy density or are there other um, more challenging factors right now? The battery is one, one factor. Two other factors are certification and public acceptance. Hmm. As you see, um, like whenever you introduce a new technology, you have people that embrace it and you have people that are scared about it. And I think we have to take that serious. This is also why we are so happy about starting commercial operation in small scale and staffs. So that gives us time to demonstrate to the population that it's safe and it's quiet. Because I think whoever has lived in a mega city knows how stressful life is in the city. And you don't want to add that additional stress factor. So we believe that our, our vehicles will not add stress to the life of the city population. Uh, it's very quiet. It, it's very, very safe, 100 times safer than any helicopter. And it's definitely adding comfort. Um, will you use it every day? At the beginning, not, because uh, the demand will be much higher than the supply. Over time, this will develop, and then it will be part of an end-to-end -end mobility analysis that you have to do every day, because um, you might use our vehicle two times a day and then the next uh, three weeks you will not use it because there are other modalities that have a better combination. But we also, we have to be modest. We are only a small part of the daily customer journey and we need to be integrated with the other modalities. And this is also the idea of Volo IQ to uh, build partnerships where we can definitely ensure that people arriving in our verticals have a smooth landing and onboarding but also a smooth offboarding where they then continue their journey. For example, in Paris, either with um, railways, with public transportation, but also with Uber or G7, which is the largest taxi operator in Paris. Um, when you said that these craft are 100 times safer than helicopters, um, uh, how, how is that the case? Because uh, we have to have fully redundant systems and the authorities, the ASA, um, they insist on the same safety level standard as it's applied for commercial aviation. Uh, so every Airbus or Boeing aircraft is certified against 10 to minus 9 safety standard, which means it only allows for one critical incident every 1 billion operating hours. And that means if you compare that to the fleet size and uh, hours of operation, it means never. Helicopters cannot achieve that level because they don't have that redundancy level. So even as a twin engine helicopter, you only achieved 10 to minus seven, which is 100 times lower on the safety level because you don't have the level of redundancy on the gearbox, on the motor and the rotor. And this is different than what we can achieve with 18 motors and rotors, where we have nine independent battery packs, each of them powering two motors and rotors. And we can lose one battery pack, we can lose two motors, 
um, and we can still save the land uh, and uh, not endangering the life of our passenger and our pilot. It's always amazing to me how different some of these things are that that seem quite similar. You know, like a, I'm a sort of fairly new owner of an EV, and I'm just aware that there is more that is different about it than first appears. And actually, the challenges that exist and the opportunities that are there are very different. Um, it seems to be the case in this space that actually the companies that are dominating are not helicopter manufacturers. They're not aerospace companies. Um, what are the kind of core competencies that a company like yours needs in order to thrive? Is it is it sort of software? Is it electrical engineering? Is it sort of partnerships and negotiating with governments? Like, what is it that you're doing so well? I, I think, first of all, um, the company decided from the beginning to concentrate on easy to certify. So you can build and design very fancy designs, but then you face massive struggle with the authorities to certify their technology. So the, the cooler it looks, the more complicated it gets. So our vehicle is a very simple vehicle and uh, everything is concentrating on making it certifiable. So here, here the one difference that we, we believe in is keep it simple, use wherever possible existing certified products and components and we're not, keep it simple so that you can certify it. And uh, we also have to accept that for the authorities like FAA and EASA, this is also the first time we certify these kind of vehicles. So we have to be 100% sure from both sides that it's safe to fly these new vehicles in our environment. So I think when we're talking about things that people um, use for transport, we're always talking about ownership. You know, people own cars. Um, there's obviously a move within more expensive things to have sort of fractional ownership or, or access. Um, how do you see the Volocopter fitting within the future urban uh, landscape? How are people going to use this and, and why? Yeah, I believe that Generation Z and, and the millennials, um, they have a different approach to it. You see, they grew up in a different environment than us, or me, for example, I, I grew up with uh, MCs, LPs, CDs, and I was proud to go to a shop to buy a CD, look at the cover, put it in a shelf, from time to take it out, look at it. My kids grew up uh, with the world of Spotify and movies with uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and many others. So for them, it's important to have access to it. It's not about ownership anymore. And I think that's driving a total different approach for that generation. Having access to mobility is super important. Owning a car or owning in the future uh, a Volo City will, in my opinion, not be relevant. First of all, they know about the resource scarcity. And uh, on, this, on the other side, they're also fully aware about the, the impact that they generate when they travel. And uh, here there will be a strong movement towards mobility as a service and ensuring that we are very careful with the amount of resources that we use. Who will pilot these things? This is um, um, an interesting question, because at the beginning, we will start with a profile of a pilot that could also fly an Airbus A320. That's very, very uh, uh, sophisticated. But of course, we need also first to convince everyone that it's safe to fly with us. And then we will enter into a discussion with the authorities. What will be the future profile of these pilots? Because let's be honest, flying in a city from A to B and backwards 10, 20 times a day is a total different profile than flying international uh, on an Airbus A320. So here we will definitely need to inter enter into a different discussion, how we train these pilots, how we certify them, before they allowed to fly these vehicles in our city or regional environment. And in my opinion, it will create a new job profile. It will be enabling people that uh, maybe half time at home uh, because of their kids that still go to school or kindergarten, but they will be able to fly our vehicle for three, four hours a day. Um, and with that, uh, be able to be home when the kids come from school. Um, so enabling a new profile, because a pilot cannot fly the whole day. We fly visual. That means if in summer we could fly probably 10 to 14 hours, but no pilot will be allowed to fly 10 to 14 hours. So 
We need anyhow two pilots per vehicle per day at least. And with that, the, the demand for that uh, amount of pilot will be, will be a new challenge for every one of us because as, as of today, we already have not enough uh, pilots for the commercial aircraft. And uh, this is a scare um, resource and the profiles are definitely missing all over the world. Will it be a lot easier to fly than current aircraft? I mean, helicopters are kind of famously very yes. challenging to fly. Um, yeah, that's another good reason why this this has to change. It's so easy to fly that it's it's not a big challenge. Uh, so um, the challenge would be just to be in that vehicle. But flying is so easy. Uh, whenever you have the chance to visit us, you can fly it in a simulator. Um, whoever. Who else um, uh, wants to get a, at least a glimpse of how it feels? Uh, in the Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator, it's also integrated. We have the Volo City in there, so and it feels pretty real already. So um, this was developed together with us. So the the flight feeling is very close to what it is to fly in a real Volo City. Uh, it's very easy. It's a joystick. It's uh, very simple. Um, based on regulations, we have to do a bit of complications because the authorities insist on separating certain functions. So we, we have to add a couple of additional features into the aircraft, like a backup control stick, like a heave inceptor, which we could all integrate into one stick. But of course, with that, we would have one single source of failure, which authorities don't want. And with that, we have to go for backup solutions as well. It was um, it, it was interesting to me last week. I actually flew in a, a friend's plane, and it was a remarkably cheap plane, and it was remarkably easy to fly. Um, it was also rather slow, um, and, and it made me realize that it's a way to look at the world in a radically different way. You know, you kind of look down on on roads, and you see the kind of two dimensional nature of the way that we think about our, our cities and our life. And I suddenly realized that the sort of space and time kind of almost blurred. And um, I think it's a fascinating sort of endeavor that you're on and it offers a, a, a big sort of literal leap, I guess, in the way that we live and a big sort of paradigm shift uh, to the future. Um, so I'm incredibly interested to see what happens next. Um, what, how should we sort of look out for this? Like what are, the, what are going to be the big sort of milestones that are reached that will suddenly make us realize that this is the kind of future that, that could exist? Yeah. I think, first of all, it will happen now. We will start flying in Paris. Then afterwards, end of the year, beginning of next year, we will fly in Rome, which is also pretty cool, where we will fly from the international airport directly into the Vatican and back. Um, so that's very cool, in my opinion. And then early 25, we have the World Exhibition in Osaka. So we will do commercial operation for the World Exhibition together with our partners. And then we will start flying also in Neom in Saudi Arabia. So we have four very uh, short uh, uh, targets that will give a glimpse of what uh, future mobility looks like. And with that, we've started then scaling. As, as I said, in parallel, we developed the next generation of the aircraft, which will be a five-seater, which will be released uh, early 27. And with that, uh, we will be then in the position gaining public acceptance, having demonstrated the authorities that we can operate these vehicles safely in a city environment. We can then start scaling. So 27 and beyond, you will see it in more and more cities. And in the 30s, when we go to more towards autonomous flying, while we are integrated into the air traffic management, we will see a massive growth of these vehicles all around the world. And yeah. It's nothing to be scared of. It's something that will just happen and it will be step by step. And then it is suddenly you look around and it's all over, like Uber. Yeah. No one expected that Uber will be any in all the countries that you can imagine. But uh, in most of the cities right now, you can order an Uber taxi right now. And this will be this process where, where we will see this vehicle uh, not only growing in cities, but of course in a regional environment. And um, people realize it's very comfortable. It's, it's a nice addition to our life. And it definitely brings more comfort and alternatives uh, into our very complicated commuter life.
Sounds amazing. The next few years sound absolutely fascinating and thrilling. Um, thanks very much for all that you're doing. And Dirk, thanks very much for coming on the show. No, it was a pleasure to be in, in your show. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you.